Now we've got here really quite a contrast in pictures. Rage going on with the preacher. And we have grace happening with God. Water flowing. Wrath by the one giving the speech. And water, soothing, cool water coming from Yahweh. It was God's grace that summoned the stream of fresh water for the hungry and thirsty Israelites as well as for the bad-tempered Moses. Now don't think for a moment, don't you think for a moment that God overlooked or excused Moses' outburst. God couldn't, and therefore God didn't. Numbers chapter 20, verse 12, the Lord said to Moses, Because you did not believe me. Because you did not believe me. And because you did not honor me as holy before the people, you will not lead them into the land I will give them. The people, after that, well, they're probably temporarily satisfied, you know, had a drink of water. Everything's okay now. No doubt Moses began to feel a little better. You kind of get that out. You've been able to strike something, a little water. He's feeling good. But God is upset. I mean, there's times, I have to tell you, when I wish I could be a trial lawyer. I would really like to defend Moses. And if I did, I would begin my defense by saying, God, can't you consider all of the unusual circumstances of this man? I mean, I know that Moses has been angry, but it's possible, especially for spiritual leaders, to be angry because you feel the people are not listening to you and are not giving you the respect. But the more I thought about this this week and looking at this verse, the more I wonder how my defense would hold up. I mean, after all, how does a leader to continue to put up with thankless whiners who are hot and thirsty and want to go home? And I would have a difficult time because Moses' indictment leveled against him is, by God, you have taken away my glory. Those who serve God are susceptible to this confusion of power and authority, but most of us don't get such a dramatic opportunity as did Moses. But God's answer to Moses and Aaron was short and direct. Deuteronomy 32. Because you broke faith with me by failing to maintain my holiness, you shall not enter the land. Now, I have to ask the question we've heard all our lives. It was Moses' anger. Really? Is that the only thing? I mean, if we're thinking about anger in his life, let's go back to the time he killed somebody, not just scarred a rock. You remember the Egyptian killed in anger? So it can't be that that's what it is. It has to be what anger did. Killing someone, no doubt, is bad. But taking away the glory of God must be worse. You know, maybe we should think hard about this manner of honoring God holy in the sight of people. I think it is an area of temptation for any of us who ever do a kind or a worthy thing to accept the praise as if we were the person with merit. But God's response is quick and in three steps. Go to Moab, climb Mount Nebo, Look over into Canaan. Our Bible study tour leader said, as we exited the bus, in a little over an hour, with arduous climbing, a little over an hour, we will be perched to see Jericho and beyond from about the same place where Moses stood. This is our fourth anniversary with you. I think you know by now I absolutely love to speak the hopeful word. I do find it difficult to talk about final loss because I find it hard to speak about no hope. But I have to confess that some things in life get broken, especially those we break that cannot be repaired in this life. And Moses learned this the hard way. He recovers from most every sin and mistake that I can read of in Scripture, but not so with what he did at Meribah. Here was a mistake that shut him out of the promised land. As I ascended the mountain, I wondered as he came to the base of that same mountain, 
as he ascended to the end of his life, I bet he said a thousand times, why, oh, why did I smash that rock? How could have I been so stupid, so arrogant to lift the spotlight off of God and to put it on me? I wonder how many times did he beg God? God, just let me go into the promised land just for the weekend. Let me go in for the day. And lo and behold, if you open up your Bible, boom, things will come rushing out of it. And it did in Deuteronomy chapter 3. It says he begged the Lord. Moses begged the Lord, please let me cross the Jordan River, the Scripture says, so that I may see the good land beyond the Jordan. I want to see the beautiful mountains and Lebanon. But Moses said, but the Lord was angry with me. And he would not listen to me. The Lord said to me, that's enough. That's enough. Don't talk to me about it anymore. Climb to the top. Look to the west. Look to the north. Look to the south. And then look to the east. You can look at the land, but you will not cross the Jordan River. Now granted, this is a puzzling story. I mean, why? is Moses' behavior on this occasion regarded as wrongful, whereas at Rephidim, prior to this, in Exodus 17, he had hit the rock for water. If you fully read the Exodus 17 story, there Moses did exactly as instructed. There's a big deviation between what was commanded and what was done, between what he did and what God wanted. Moses was instructed here in Deuteronomy 32 to take the rod... Assemble the congregation and speak to the rock. But in the actual, he takes the rod, brings the people, speaks to them, and then in haste and anger, smacks the rock. And still, it brings forth water. Had you thought about that? It was not the way God intended it to be. And, but God looked at it and gave them grace, but He counted this act by Moses as rebellion. Rebellion that He considered to be unbelief in disobeying the instructions and showing a lack of respect for the rock, which had become the very symbol of God's presence, Moses was failing to sanctify God. That means he was not acknowledging God publicly for His purity, for His divine unapproachability. Failure to uphold God's holiness is the core. It was his failure to give proper consideration to just who God is. It was a denial of the magnificence of the Lord and His glorious Lordship, conscious or not, to reduce God to a human level. Spoken plainly, that was Moses' sin. He reduced God to a human level. He had failed to honor Yahweh as holy. He had publicly tarnished the glory that belonged to God. On that June evening in which George led, George led our Bible study group up Mount Nebo, I must confess I was a bit perplexed over God's dealings with Moses. Under my skin, I've had a problem ever since I've returned from the spot where I took this picture. I mean, how could God deny Moses' entrance into the promised land? I mean, all those insidious little things they were doing, I was even getting kind of mad at the group with what they were saying to George. And yet, God brings him to a vista, the vista from which I was standing. God cared for Moses. There's more of the story. In fact, in Jude 9, there is a non-biblical story that hints at the special protection that was afforded the very body of Moses. And furthermore, if you read to the end of Deuteronomy, a couple more chapters, it states that God personally buried Moses Moses on Mount Nebo, probably to deter people from building a site-specific monument, which they've done anyway, but probably because God himself wanted to bury him, and the Israelites couldn't do it well enough. Later on, 
God still holds Moses up. In the pages of the New Testament, God calls forth Moses from the dead. Yes, do I have it right, church? He called Moses from the dead to encourage Jesus. And where did this happen? It was in the Promised Land. It was on the Mount of Transfiguration. And there he was standing as a part of the big three, Elijah and Jesus and Moses. But the question is now no longer for Moses. The question is for Kurt. The question is for you. How might we be failing to sanctify God? How might we be failing to acknowledge publicly God's glory? That's the take home. In our lives, what might we be doing? What might we not be doing that would give the people around us the proper view of the magnificence and the uniqueness of God? Do any of our actions reduce God to a human level? Do we publicly tarnish the glory of God that belongs to the Father? Do we privately tarnish the glory of God that belongs to the Heavenly Father Plainly spoken, church, have we failed to honor God as holy?